question conference call before we begin i would like to mention that some of the statements made in today's discussion may be forward looking in nature and may involve risk and uncertainty certainties a detailed statement in this regard is available in our invest update which has been emailed to you and also posted on our corporate website this call will be accompanied with earnings call presentation detail of the same have already been shared with you as a reminder all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes should you need assistance during the conference call please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone please note that this conference is being recorded i now hand the conference over to mr krishna bodanapu managing director and ceo thank you and over to you sir thank you very much stephen and good afternoon everyone uh, thank you for joining us especially on a short notice on uh, the uh, acquisition update of ctec uh, uh, like we said in the release it is the uh, largest uh, acquisition to date for us and therefore we thought uh, we should uh, take a few minutes to uh, give you the rationale and explain uh, what uh, uh, we, uh, explain the uh, uh, rationale for the acquisition and also how we plan to integrate it and more importantly leverage it uh, going forward uh before i get started with that uh, can i also introduce a few of my colleagues who are on this uh, call we have mr rajay agarwal the chief financial officer mr kartik and mr rajin the chief operating officer dr narsimham the uh, chief hr officer of uh, science uh, they are all here on the call i also want to welcome uh, mr johan vasima who is the uh, chief executive officer of ctech uh, who is joining us from uh, finland on this call uh, today and we'll uh, hear from johan at the end of uh, 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 ajay's remarks on the financials um, in a few minutes so i will uh, uh, let johan um, um, give a little bit more of a brief on ctech at that uh, point but uh, with that if i may first um, take you through uh, quickly the positioning uh, and just to refresh everybody uh, over the last couple of years we've been refining our positioning as consulting like industry centric technology solutions and there's three elements of it the first element is the consulting piece where we're helping our client our, our clients um articulate the problem flush out the problem and then articulate the solution industry centric where our domain expertise which has really been our differentiator for a long time that plays in where we've brought in um obviously as, as many of you follow us quite a bit we've brought in significant amount of uh, differentiation in industries like the aerospace and communications and ultimately the technology solutions piece which is really at the evolution of the business where uh, to the technology organization we're able to build and deploy articulate and monitor that is the technology solution so the idea behind um, our positioning is is really that uh, we are able to help our clients both uh, um, uh, or through a combination of our consulting experience our domain experience and our solution capabilities solve problems that really matter to them and using technology to solve these problems and, and this might not be very new for many of you given that you follow us for the certain this is how we position the organization um in that context uh, uh, one of the industries that we've been meaning to uh, strengthen is the uh, process and plant engineering uh, industry or the, I, i guess it's, it's plant engineering related sectors and in that context uh, we signed definitive agreements to uh, acquire cytec or cytec sorry um cytec uh, or signed will by 100% of cytec who i said are an organization that uh, provides plant engineering related services but of course as an addition to that engineering consulting product engineering and technical documentation uh, primarily the clients are energy companies and uh, some uh, mining companies especially on the product uh, side why did we do this uh, deal uh, it uh, helps position sign very strongly in plant engineering uh sign already had a, a, a small plant engineering capability but with the addition of ctech significant plant engineering capability this will make us one of the largest independent plant engineering companies and that the that the sector is growing quite well uh, and also the next point is which which is very important is that sector is also adopting a number of newer technologies around digital and uh, the uh, uh, digital capabilities which we built a lot of good uh, solution so it helps us take the solution portfolio um, of uh, science and the and the technology portfolio of science into these process industries 
It gives us access to multiple global companies in the energy process plant, and, and also it's a bridgehead into other process-related industries such as uh, uh, pharma, food processing, etc. And uh, lastly, it also helps us diversify our uh, portfolio of industries. As, as you know, there have been a few industries which have uh, gone through a bit of cyclicality, and we thought long and hard about uh, some of the diversification of risk and, and moving away from the cyclicality, and we believe this gives us a fantastic opportunity to diversify into these plant, uh, uh, plant engineering related uh, industries, which then add to it some of the capabilities that we've already built in mining, in plant engineering, and also mi uh, in uh, 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 mining. Um, you know, it, it, it creates a very solid portfolio of us. We're, going to, we're calling that cluster as MEU, which is mining energy and nuclear piece, which is another big industry. But the MEU sector will, will be very uh, well positioned. Uh, uh, for science in the, um, in the market. Uh, the key strengths of CTEC are um, uh, the scale in plant engineering. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of energy transition that's going on, uh, you know, with uh, the adoption of uh, capable, uh, or with the uh, um, um, uh, imperative to move towards more and more green energy, including hydrogen, biomass, um, and so on and so forth. CTEC brings some very strong capabilities, and, and uh, we believe that this will position science in a unique manner, and like I said, this will make us one of the largest independent plant engineering companies, and we're very excited because, you know, not just what that market will do, which I'll talk about, but more importantly, how our technology portfolio plays into that market, and it should be a, a game changer for us. Um, if we if I may just introduce CTEC, and uh, um, in a few minutes I'll also then request uh, uh, Johan to talk about it in a little bit more detail. But it's a company that was founded in 1984, headquartered in Varsa and Finland. That's where a lot of the uh, energy OEMs uh, are. Um, but uh, the capabilities include plant engineering, product engineering. Um, primarily, we will be then based in the Nordics, Finland, Norway, Sweden. But also, we will we'll then get good capability in uh, France and, and, and Germany. But I'd say one of the most appealing things of, of uh, CTEC is also more than 50% of their staff is already based in India. So what that does is CTEC already has built a global engineering model and has done it very successfully given that more than 50% of their staff is in India. So they're a company unlike us in very complementary industries. So when we first came across this business, it was a no-brainer um, no kind of put it that way for us. And again, I'm very excited that the deal has gone through and we'll now be able to work closely and integrate with uh, CTEC. There are about 500 employees, and uh, in terms of financials, last year's revenue was uh, roughly 80 million euro with 13 percent uh, EBIT margin. And uh, in a few minutes, again, I'll request Ajay to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Should we go to the next slide? Um, there are three uh, areas that uh, we are uh, again very uh, uh, clear on where we can bring value. The first is what I talked about: plant engineering. Plant engineering uh, is an industry which is uh, where the uh, um, the uh, outsourced uh, uh, addressable spend is almost two and a half billion dollars, growing at six percent. So that makes it quite an exciting market for us because obviously that's a good growth market. The second piece where I, where I talked about bringing our digital capabilities around the various things that we've built, like as and we've talked to you about this multiple times around asset management, smart plants, and so on, so forth, smart factories, and so on. That's a three billion um, uh, 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 camp, um, and that's growing 15 to 20 percent. So that makes it quite exciting for us. And lastly, is turbo machinery. This is these are the uh, equipment that that includes things like steam turbines, gas turbines, pumps, compressors which also aligns closely with our more traditional product engineering business, and we have a number of customers. Um, there's a little bit of an overlap, but thankfully there's a, there's a very good complementary set of customers. But that's a market, as you know, they're quite familiar with. This is the traditional engineering that we've done. And CTEC also has a very strong capability there, and that market is growing 3 to 5% at about 1.1 billion. And, and actually, as a, as a little bit of an extension, Turbo machinery is actually very similar. Uh, I mean, I'll take that back. Turbo machinery is similar to uh, aero engines because uh, both of them are uh, rotating gas turbines. 
and, and you sit again, complements very well, and that's what we also see is to achieve people and the ability to move around. But net net, we believe that this is a market that's six to seven billion dollars. This is only the engineering for gas power plants and, and the other areas, um, not not the uh, overall uh, spend, but just the outsourced engineering spend that we can address is about six point six billion dollars, growing at ten percent. So it's a great market. We have a unique and differentiated capacity, so the future looks quite, uh, quite promising and quite exciting, uh, and, and we're, we're really looking forward to partnering with CTEC in this show. If I may then double click a little bit into the, uh, uh, into the plant engineering, especially around, around uh, the uh, power plants, um, if you look at it, the global installed capacity is growing 3, three to 3.5% three um, every year, and it's uh, expected to grow. Um, of course, areas like coal, which is not really a focus area for us, have, have uh, stagnated. But the two areas that are growing quite a bit are uh, obviously the um, uh, renewables and uh, also um, uh, the uh, natural gas um, uh, sectors and, and hydro also to some extent. But these are the two areas that are growing and these are the areas that CTEC actually does quite well in. And I want to, and if we go to the next slide, um, if you look at the renewables, um, most renewables, and this is a very interesting thing for us to keep in mind, most renewables actually have a gas backup because as, as, as we all know, solar and wind can have a bit of a reliability problem because you don't get 24 hours support out of them. So both of these sectors have a gas backup. And that gas backup, which is the core of the design that uh, CTEC does both in the equipment and on the plant, is growing at 8.5% CHER. So we believe that this positions us very, very uniquely in the market because there's not many markets of this size which grow 8.5% as a market. And CTEC has a differentiated position in this market, which is growing at a fairly aggressive pace. So next, next, my point is if I if we just um, uh, dig deeper into the whole um, um, logic, logic of why we did it, it is a great market. We found ourselves a very good niche position, and that position is actually growing at eight and a half percent. So positions us very well uh, in that sector. And of course, there is the adoption of uh, digital, which is growing at ten to fifteen or fifteen to twenty percent. And of course, lastly, the turbo machinery. So we we found ourselves a very very nice uh, uh, position at the spot which we believe will help us grow and actually make growth uh, into the future. And if I may just uh, take you quickly to the next slide, you know, this is a good summary. We, we see that in the immediate term, we will do well in the energy and in the marine and mining. Uh, in the short term, we will then extend into wind and solar in a, in a lot more sustainable manner. And then in the longer term, it will put us into other agencies like nuclear, pharma, and semicon, semiconductor that is. So the story all ties in uh, very well. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions, but before that, I'll first request Ajay to take us through some of the financials of the uh, transaction. Ajay, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Krishna. Uh, I am very, very uh, delighted to uh, report, uh, you know, further to what Krishna said in terms of this acquisition. Uh, you all had received uh, this uh, weekend about our earnings growth of 40%, uh, and uh, also the industry leading. Uh, earnings and some of you also had a concern around the uh, uh, revenue growth. So I definitely see that Krishna said this is a great initiative by us to widen the portfolio and not only have the industry leading earnings uh, growth but also get back uh, to the industry leading uh, revenue growth. Uh, in terms of uh, how will it uh, specifically uh, impact uh, uh, the uh, details uh, in terms of uh, the financial. Uh, we are uh, trying to complete this closing in early May. Uh, that's the most likely uh, scenario. If our uh, team, we should be able to, we will be able to, uh, you know, consolidate it for 11 months in this particular uh, year. And that's how, uh, when you look at the numbers, the first column for 23, we have given you the numbers for 11 months, how they will look like for 23. Uh, in terms of uh, growth, first let me say that you know, we already gave an outlook of 13 to 15 percent growth uh, for organic. So this is incremental to what we talked to you on the earnings call. So over and above that, we expect an addition of about this number 83 to 87 million based on the uh, uh, 11 months financial. Uh, in terms of the uh, margin, uh, we are planning to make this as 14 to 16 percent kind of a uh, uh, margin business. Last two years, it has been about 15%. So when you look at 
the 30% number in Krishna's uh, uh, presentation uh, that was uh, more of, you know, uh, just in EBITDA. If you see, uh, for the last two uh, years, they have consistently given about 15%, uh, and the last year number is uh, significantly uh, higher than 15%, but we are uh, looking at 14 to 16%. We also have already embarked on our initiatives and expansion. Good thing is it already has the India leg. This is an opportunity for uh, uh, you know further offshoring as well. Right now they are at a level of 20 22 percent in terms of the offshore uh, revenue. And there are other uh, initiatives that are uh, possible. I'm sure Karthik uh, can address some of them as we proceed into the questions and answers. So we are very confident uh, that you know unlike in the past, you had a concern that you know uh, we are uh, compromising on quality of uh, our revenue or the profile of our EBIT. Uh, I want to assure the investors that this will not be diluted to us. Except for the first year, we have to make sure that we make certain investments in upgrading the IT, the cyber security, and some of the uh, things that are required in terms of integration of the business. For that, we have to spend some amount, and because of that, there will be a little headwind on the margin uh, for the first. And we have also quantified uh, how much will be the impact of that. Uh, as we see it uh, right now. APS is a creative. We also quantified for you. Uh, this is over and above the EPS that we uh, talked to you as part of our uh, output. So it's absolutely uh, uh, accurate. Uh, and uh, we are looking at, uh, you have seen consistently, we have been taken about 50% debt to make sure that, you know, our belief is in line with our strategy. There is a huge, huge potential for us to make investments. And we are not uh, compromising in any way in terms of the cash and the opportunity to sort of make sure that we have a nice capital budget. So in that uh, uh, perspective, you know, all of our acquisitions we have been doing 50 percent because this also means that you know we get the financing completely tied in for uh, interest and for an exchange uh, at uh, you know rates which are marginally lower than three percent. So it brings down the cost of capital. It brings the tax liability down, uh, and that I have been explaining to the, uh, all of you time and again. Similar approach we are taking here, and when I say the EPS equation, this EPS equation is after taking into account that particular cost of uh, uh, debt. Free cash flow is in line for the last uh, uh, two years, where free cash flow conversion has been 60% uh, on uh, average. The DS flow is about 80 85 days, but we will make sure that you know we will run a campaign and bring it in line. That's what uh, we can comment in terms of free cash flow. Uh, as you know, uh, this entity will have the benefit of European uh, uh, tax rates, so it does have a little uh, scope for improvement on our ETR uh, based on the proportion of uh, PBT. Uh, and uh, we also looked at in terms of a good win win between the seller and the buyer to make sure that you know whatever is our EB2 debate is decorative and all of our issues are positive uh, on this particular transaction. And this becomes really, very really exciting uh, acquisition for us to widen our uh, base and to deliver you not only industry leading uh, earning growth but also the industry leading uh, revenue growth. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I will invite Johan uh, to uh, make some comments that you would like to make about uh, Tytech, and then, of course, Johan will also be available during the question and answer session. Uh, so, hand over to you, Johan, and after that, we can take the questions. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we yes, can hear you. Please proceed. Very good. Okay, so thank you. And first of all, I want to say that I'm really excited about this journey that we start now together with science. So, so I see huge opportunities there. But I would like to go through with you a few things. One brief update of, of CTEC, what kind of company we are, and what we are focusing on. And then the second part is, is about what are the opportunities we from CTEC side see of this um, partnering with science. So first, CTEC is a multidisciplined engineering company. And we focus on plant engineering, product engineering. We also have technical documentation and digital solutions. And the majority of our business is in the energy sector. So really strong foothold in this area. And that is interesting because there is so big transition happening in the energy sector with renewables and so forth. Today, we are approximately 1,200 experts 
And our offices, we are located in Finland, Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, India. And our head office is in Finland, a small, smaller town called Bas. And uh, we have two locations in India, one in Mumbai and the other one in Pune. And our well, business model that we have, so our business model is that we have really strong knowledge competence close to our customers. We have several OEM customers, technology companies, and our organization is located very close to these to help them with engineering uh, work. And, and once we have done this understanding, packaging it, then we do the majority of the work with our experts in India. And what we provide our customers is competence, flexibility, and cost efficiency. And this is highly valued from our customers. And this has to be with superior quality. So this is what we do, CIPEC. And, uh, and uh, when it comes to second thing, how do I see the future together now with science? As I said, I'm truly happy that, that uh, CITEC and science are partnering and starting to build the future together. Uh, you know, the, the journey starts now, and we will start to do the planning integration step by step going forward. And what's really interesting, what we see the value from, from CTEC side, is the big organization, the global organization that science has, with the over 14,000 experts, truly global company. That will help us serve our customers globally. And then the other thing is the strong competence, the strong offerings, and especially the digital offerings that science has. This will really give us a new, the digital offering to a new level to our customers. So, so I'm really excited about this journey that we are about to start now. So, so thank you for my side and over to Krishna. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Mukul Garg from Motilalosal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Krishna, I just uh, wanted to uh, start with uh, you know the uh, revenue expectation for uh, FI23 from uh, the acquisition. Uh, because then if we look at uh, you know, the commentary which uh, you know, Citex shared uh, in their December filing to European uh, debt exchanges, uh, they were talking about uh, expectation of 100 million euros uh, revenues, uh, while the numbers which you guys are uh, quoting, you know, are giving an impression of uh, the growth being flattish uh, for uh, the next fiscal year. So, if you can just help us understand, uh, has there been any change in uh, market, uh, you know, view from their end? And uh, also, you know, if you can uh, help clarify uh, the factors which kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of kept uh, them from growing over last seven to eight years, uh, the growth, you know, the company has not uh, seen a meaningful growth uh, over last many years, uh, despite, uh, you know, a single small acquisition also. So what really is changing in the current environment? Uh, Johan, may I uh, request you to uh, answer the, the question? I think there's two parts of it. One is from your filings in December to uh, now, uh, we are uh, looking at a, a different growth trajectory because uh, uh, the expectation was 100 million in uh, that filing. Um, maybe if you, could, if you could answer that too, we could uh, then move on to the second part of the question. And you have if I can help you if you look at uh, you know the number that they have given in this uh, presentation, uh, which comes to uh, around uh, you know for 11 months what we are talking about the number uh, of uh, 83 to 87. This is this is only for 11 months, and if I take it for 12 months, it will be something like 93 million dollars. 
Just want to clarify your answer this for 11 months. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Unfortunately, the line is a bit bad, so I did not get, get all the, the, the questions. <laughs> Didn't hear exactly so. So, so from that perspective, it's very difficult for me to answer. But, but if I just said that our midterm, what we have come out is to say that our midterm target is to reach 100 million, and, and this is what what on, on the revenue side, and we are on that that path. And and uh, and uh, I don't see, uh, you know, it's, there is opportunities and the transition that's happening in Europe in the energy side. It's something we're really looking into at the moment. So, so, so unfortunately, I didn't catch all the, the questions here. So, so I'm not able to answer that's, that's, more than that. That's, that's helpful, John. I think uh, uh, just to clarify, John's point is that guidance that they're given is for the middle, and to just correlate it to our JS numbers, that would be 93 million or so for uh, uh, for this year, give or take. And uh, I'll just say that that will actually be a, a good growth compared to the previous year. And uh, also the first quarter of the year has gone quite well, so we're quite confident in the uh, number that uh, Ajay talked about. In terms of the second uh, uh, part of the question, I think uh, there's been a lot of focus that uh, Johan and his management team over the last two to three years have brought um, uh, in terms of uh, the profitability. If you look at uh, the, uh, while the growth has been, uh, has, has, or it's been flat from a revenue perspective, from a profitability perspective, they've actually done a fantastic job. And uh, the margins have grown from uh, mid single digits to almost uh, the 15% number is an EBITDA number. So the focus has really been there. And uh, uh, from our perspective, um, the, the good thing has been that uh, one is we see the strength of operations now that all the hard work has been done by uh, the team. And the second thing is the growth has on top of it come back. If you look at the $93 million number compared to the 80-some number that they would have done uh, uh, last year, that's a, uh, that's a quite a significant growth. So it's, it's, a, it's a good point in time for us to uh, have uh, come in. Uh, so Krishna Ajay, just to clarify, uh, you know the numbers which the company has reported are in euros, and uh, your guidance is in dollars. So, uh, you know, uh, 80 million uh, euros versus uh, you know 84, 85 million dollars uh, are fairly comparable. Uh, I don't think that growth is being factored into your guidance. Uh, if you can, uh, so that that was just the point I wanted to highlight. Uh, and also, if you can just uh, give a overview on. Uh, how do you see the medium term EBITDA margin? Uh, you know, the company last quarter delivered an EBITDA margin in, in mid 20s. So, you know, is that something which was more of an one off? If I can say that, uh, Krishna, see, one is, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, done an extensive uh, sort of, you know, do the business and work together, uh, yeah, including that, you know, some of the initiatives take time to kick off. So we have built it not from the guidance that was given. We have built it from, as Krishna said, from where they have left the year. And what gap you are seeing is more like, you know, between the high said that, you know, the number I'm getting is 11 months, if you analyze it, and then uh, the gap will be about uh, $20 million. It will be 92 million versus 110 million dollars if you take everything in dollars, which Krishna said is for mid, uh, mid year. But I would say that, you know, we have done our due diligence and our business is not wise. What guidance has been given? We have used experts, we have uh, used our business team, we have spent a lot of time, a lot of people have gone there. So we are very confident of what we are giving as, uh, you know, our outlook for the business. And I would not read too much into it except saying that that is the ambition and a target they are taking. We as a company, as time, are willing to uh, commit this number uh, of, uh, you know, uh, close to 83 to $87 million for this year and $100 million plus minus $2 million for the next year. As far as margin is concerned, yes, I think uh, the last year margin as such, if you see, uh, was 17 percent. Uh, the year before that was also about 15 percent. Then we have also looked at, you know, when a smaller company gets integrated into us, we also looked at in the due diligence perspective, uh, what are the one-offs, for example, uh, you know, when you look at the COVID impact and cutting off travel, cutting off some space and all that. So I think it is after a lot of due diligence when we say that, you know, we can look at a margin of 14 to 16 percent. Uh, with one off in first year for the investment that we will make in integration, we have done it after a lot of due diligence. I would not go for that integration. I would say please trust our due diligence and look at the outlook that we are giving. Fair enough. Uh, thanks for answering my question. I will get back into the queue.
Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep S. from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, uh, if you can come closer to the device, please. Yeah, I'm actually closer. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is better, sir. Please proceed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, wanted to check, when I check the annual report of CTEC, uh, they also have a bet worth 27 million euros on their books. So just wanted to understand whether that bet also being transferred to science books and over and above that, we would be financing this deal with 50% of the debt. So considering this, EPS operation may be slightly lower. So, uh, I would say that, you know, we are very clear as a policy that once uh, we do all the transactions, debt free, cash free, uh, and if you look at, uh, in some way, we are looking at the number that we have given for the unit, and then we have a debt on that, and we have a cash. So, those will be the closing adjustments. As far as, uh, you know, the debt is concerned, we are still examining, talking to some of the bondholders, talking to their advisors, and how we deal with it. Uh, and our most likely preference will be to discharge it. We are looking at two options, whether to take 50% of that on debt, uh, uh, again, you know, sub-3%, or to look at full. Just give us some time, along with the closing, we will be able to so, Ajay, is it, uh, just to clarify, the debt which is currently sitting on CTEX book uh, worth 27-28 million euros will not be transferred to the signed book, right? It's... That is right. It will not be transferred. Uh, it will be retired uh, as part of the closing in simultaneous or free conditions those details we are working. So, as, as when we have our quarter one call, there will be no debt uh, on that particular uh, uh, asset for us. Uh, and as I said, some of the details we are working with them in terms of payment. So this retirement of debt would be done by the previous management, right? So we are working on those details. Yes, our condition is that, but it will not be right in my opinion to, uh, we are working in a very collaborative spirit. I think we are all waiting show. So in principle, it will be retired. It will not come in our books. And we are working together uh, to uh, sort of discharge it. That's what I can say. Okay, okay. And just a second question, Ajay, just wanted to understand uh, what would be the acquisition amortization of the purchase consideration, what proportion would be uh, uh, allocated towards the acquired intangibles and how you will amortize any color on that? So I think the next step would be uh, that, you know, we have, as part of the closing, we have to do that uh, typical asset uh, allocation and proportion of uh, purchase consideration. I don't have that report right now. So we have made some estimates based on our past historical numbers. Give us some time, uh, you know, uh, uh, after we announce the closing and in the quarter one call, we can explain to you. Right now, we have used some estimates based on our historical relations. Okay, okay. And just last few things, uh, the acquired company has a healthy EBITDA margin of 18.6%, uh, 18.7% in CY21. So is it fair to say at EBITDA level, this margin is sustainable or you believe uh, this was largely driven through because of the of saving in COVID times, which may not repeat going forward starting uh, CY22? So I would say two comments. Yes, I think in near term, we are breaking in 14 to 16%. You are right, some of the costs is related to COVID. And you also have to be careful, you know, when, uh, 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 you know, you are buying a business and this is up for sale. So I would say 14 to 16 percent is what we are looking at near term. But yes, there could be, uh, you know, opportunities, including, uh, you know, already a footprint into India and can we enhance that and also we are looking at that, uh, whether we can go back to those levels. But I would say near and medium term, for the next two years, I would say the margin of 14 to 16 percent. Okay, but I was talking about EBIT margin, not the EBIT margin. So what you are talking is 14... Uh, Mr. Sandeep, sorry to interrupt. Your voice is breaking up. No, but uh, I think I, I think with Sandeep's point, and I, what I did say, so basically this is the EBIT margin. Now, EBIT you can extrapolate out of it. I mean, obviously, we focus on EBIT more than EBIT. So we, we, we're talking about the EBIT margin now. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, you have any other questions? No, actually, I couldn't be able to hear the management what they said in the previous uh, question to reply. 
see what we are saying is that you know looking at uh, some of the next steps in terms of uh, purchase consideration which will decide some of the amortization norm right now we would be able to say that you know the 18.6 or whatever you are referring to is not sustainable 14 to 16 percent is what we are targeting for year one and year two and then further we will work on improving the margin uh, between debate and if it are given some more time we will be not be able to come in right now Okay, okay. Uh, I have more questions. Will come in the queue. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha Agarwal from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking the question. Um, just wanted to understand how does the volatility in the gas sector impact the financials of the point eighty two? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the, the way that we've uh, looked at it and the way that we've understood it is that uh, the, um, um, the the projects that uh, CTEC works on are quite long-term in nature. They are quite uh, uh, supportive of uh, not just you know the gas sector as one, but uh, as we talked about, they also work on renewable energy because renewable energy almost always comes with uh, gas backup. So it's, it's a balance of these two things. So the, the, while uh, there is going to be, uh, sorry, that's one element. The second element is also if you look at with all the volatility now, there's a lot of rethink in terms of energy transition, in terms of rebalancing the supply and the sources. Uh, there's a lot of background noise. I think whoever uh, needs to go on mute, please. Um, so there is all these things start to come in. So taking all that into account, we're quite confident that uh, CTEC and, and of course then add science with some of the uh, capabilities that we have will become a very differentiated thing. The second thing is uh, a lot of CTEC's uh, capability and expertise is also in building, uh, designing for the building of the plants. Um, we also do some work on uh, the digital aspects and the technology aspects, which is basically around the operations of the plant. And that's where we've built a lot of good uh, capabilities. So we believe, keeping in line with our design and maintain um, value chain, it also helps us move across the value chain uh, in terms of uh, providing the operations-related uh, services and solutions. So taking both these things into account, I think we're, we're quite well positioned in terms of uh, um, how the, the how how we can uh, offer these services to the market, notwithstanding the current volatility in some areas of the market. Right. And uh, can you also talk something about their client concentration? How many clients do they have, and what does the client concentration look like? Um, see, the the, uh, the top five clients, I think, um, uh, are about seventy percent of the revenue, seventy seventy five percent of the revenue. That's one of the things that we quite like on the uh, business because uh, there are five clients who are who are absolutely strategic clients, even from a client perspective. Uh, one of them is a common client, but not in a very large manner for for us. And therefore, we think that uh, uh, it's a it's a good uh, um, sort of uh, supplement in terms of how it works. So five clients are about seventy seventy five percent, and we actually like that quite a bit of our business. Right. And uh, currently, within portfolio, how big is of you know of plant engineering for us? And if you could give that just a bit. We do about uh, sub ten million dollars in terms of our plant engineering today, and uh, we definitely believe uh, with an additional capabilities that we are getting in and our ability to bring synergy on the digital uh, side of the plant engineering, whether it is digital twin or predictive maintenance, and our ability to support the plant operations. I think that would help us to address. The growth in double digits in the integrated capabilities over the next three to five years, and also the biggest opportunity that we are looking forward to is on the energy transition, and which is likely to happen in the next 20 years, and uh, to meet uh, the emission standards that are being agreed by most of the countries, and this could mean roughly about 50, 60% greenhouse gas emission reduction, or about 15 trillion dollars spent. So there is a huge capex that needs to be spent. And uh, three fourth of them has to be on the clean energy, and that's going to be an opportunity that we are really going to bet on for the next uh, 20 years or so. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vikas Ahuja from Antique Stock Broking. Please go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just one small clarification, if I heard it correctly. Did you say uh, that on uh, EBITDA margins, uh, it's uh, for FY23, it's going to be in the range of 14 to 16 percent? Uh, sorry, I missed that part. So you can refer to the slide for everybody. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, if you look at at the bottom of the slide, we have said EBIT margin is likely to be 14 to 16 percent. So we are all, in all the discussions that we have, we have talked about the big margin. Does that clarify? Uh, okay, okay. And and, and it still be a net profit, uh, in terms of net profit, it's a check rate for FY23. Yes. You can take the slide. I don't know if you have access to the Sorry, I, I think I, I must miss the PPD. I joined. It's executive on uh, EPS. I'll read out the numbers. It is executive by about 3 rupees in year 1 and about 5 to 6 rupees in year 2. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Saurabh Tadani from IFL. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I just had a, uh, had a question on the earnouts. Are there any earnouts as part of the transaction, given that's a trend that we've seen in a lot of the recent transactions in the space? Uh, if not, then how do we plan to uh, protect future performance as well as senior management retention uh, for the speed? So there's no uh, earnouts. This was a, we're, we're uh, acquiring this company or acquiring the shares from a private equity called uh, Sentica, which is a Finnish private equity. So obviously, given the nature of the transaction, there is no uh, uh, earnouts per se. Of course, from, uh, from the past perspective, I think one is uh, therefore our diligence process was a lot more uh, detailed than what we would normally do, which Sentica and, and, and the CTEC management were very uh, helpful with. So that gives us the content. And of course, the reps and warranties and insurances and so on and so forth uh, in the off case that uh, we need to uh, uh, protect ourselves. Of course, the second point, which is, I'd say, the more important thing, which is the uh, motivation and retention of senior management. Uh, we're working with uh, Johan and the team uh, on uh, making sure that we put together uh, an attractive retention package, especially for the key, uh, key people. And uh, we will do that through uh, more through the uh, uh, both the summer science uh, um, uh, retention measures, including ESOPs and, and uh, RSUs and the first uh, bonuses and so on and so forth. So that's how we uh, plan to protect uh, the uh, uh, leadership that is there. And, and not just the uh, business leadership, but also technical leadership, because that's something that uh, uh, is very, very um, unique about CTEC is the uh, capability that brings uh, the organization to the team. Got it. Thank you. That's all for my time. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Shindarkar from Ingrid Capital. Please go ahead. Mr. Abhishek, your line is in talk mode. Kindly go ahead with a question, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on the acquisition. Um, um, maybe this question is for Johan, uh, you know, if you can hear us clearly. Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, decadal performance of this company, um, you know, media articles suggest that, uh, uh, you know, this was a thousand member, 50 million euro uh, company in 2011, and you had targets to double the revenue in 2015. So if you can just explain, you know, what has gone to uh, you know, maybe what was right, something went wrong, or anything in terms of, you know, what changed uh, during the decade. That is first question. And the second question is, uh, you know, on the CTEC website, uh, it seems that, uh, uh, you know, there is an update that, you know, the, the conditional call to redeem the outstanding bond loan uh, is put up. Uh, so this question is, um, you know, I think to the earlier question again, that uh, are they kind of paying the loan outstanding, uh, which is on the books of CTEC? Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Anna, are you uh, in a position to answer the third part of the question? Yes. So, so um, can you hear me? Yes, now it's clear. Very good. So, so first of all, yes, uh, Sentica acquired the company in 2011, and, and the size of the company was what it was then, and, and it was a plan to, to, to grow the company. But the plan did not really, maybe they didn't meet the, the target they set then, and I joined the company in December 17, and, and uh, 
I would say that the company, there was a lot of positive things, good customer relationships, good, good uh, uh, competence in the organization set up, everything was there. But there was something that we had to put focus on. It was focusing on increasing control, project delivery control, business control, sales control, all these things. Then we looked on the cost structure to fit on a healthy cost structure, and then went for a growth. And when we put this systematically in place, now the company is healthy and we are on track as we discussed earlier. Maybe coming to the bond things, I'll give the word over to Krishna. Uh, I think uh, maybe Ajay will not say that. So again, uh, you know, I would first of all say that, you know, none of us or people should be worried about the bond. It's just the uh, issue that we have been discussing as part of the closing the transaction and everything is agreed, uh, both in, uh, technically as well as, uh, you know, uh, in spirit. Uh, the issue clearly is that, you know, uh, we have to retire this debt, it has been agreed. We are ready with the funding to retire the debt. Uh, only question is, I don't want to pay the debt unless I become the owner. So we have to do it simultaneously or put it in a So some formalities are there just to conclude that. So I want to give a comfort that as far as we are concerned, uh, we will not have this debt on our books. As far as how do we do it between now and closing the transaction, we are working out those formalities and I don't see a uh, slightest of the risk uh, on those formalities. The cost of debt, finally, that we will have on our estate is going to be one of the best. Fully tied in for interest in foreign exchange uh, will be less than 3%. These are the three comments, sir. Uh, thanks. Uh, that answers my question. Thank you for taking my question and best wishes. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sudhir Guntupalli from Kotak Mahindra. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thanks Krishna and uh, thanks Ajay. Uh, I think this question was asked in a few different ways earlier and uh, and and at least I am uh, very much confused on this aspect. Uh, so just if you can provide further clarity, it will be great. So your press release mentions that enterprise value of 94 million on a debt-free and cash-free basis. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, whatever is the closing cash on the balance sheet that belongs to us, subject to the uh, uh, closure. Uh, but what I'm trying to understand is what exactly is the consideration that we are paying in whatsoever form and fashion, be it uh, the cash that we are giving to the exiting private equity company or the debt we are retiring. So what is the cost to sign to kind of uh, make this acquisition go through? Uh, the wording of enterprise value on a debt-free basis is is little confusing. So Ajay, if you can provide clarity on that, that's my first question. Uh, in whatsoever form and fashion. Can I take the first one? one? Can I take the first one? You are concerned. I want to make sure first you get comfortable before you go to the next. Yes, yes, Ajay. Yeah, as we have said in our uh, stock exchange release, the enterprise value is at 6.38, right? And that's 94 million. Okay, what we are going to pay them in cash? Is going to be 68 million uh, uh, euros. All numbers we have given the stock exchange in euros. I want to be very, very transparent. Uh, all the bonds will be uh, paid to the bondholders. I have already explained about the uh, maximum. And cash, whatever is there, will be retained uh, in the uh, book. Our rough estimates uh, give us this calculation of 68. And uh, so this will be, uh, you know, uh, this will be for maximum. So if you're asking me, 68 million is the cash outflow from us to the seller plus taking off the bonds on the balance sheet which is there and uh, in terms of the uh, cash that's the normal uh, adjustment which is there, there is no equity. As far as financing of this 94 is concerned, I already explained, we will do 50-50 or maybe a little higher uh, looking at some of the consideration to the extent of the share. I hope this clarifies. So you mean to say that the total consideration is 94 million euros, right? We are not going to pay... Enterprise value, enterprise value is 94 million. Cash okay. free okay, sir. Uh, let me ask this way. So including everything in all forms and fashion, our cost to sign to make this acquisition go through will not be greater than 94 million euros. Yes. That's the Yes. That's the Sure. And my second question, if I look at, uh, uh, you know, EV upon sales, EV upon revenue, 
this is roughly 1.2 times uh, of uh, uh, calendar 21 revenue looks like a fairly attractive number and the seller is is a private equity company uh, so i'm little surprised as to uh, who exactly is leaving value on the table here is it because is it uh, the multiple is so attractive because uh, this entity has not seen much of a growth over the previous several years or is there something else that uh, we are missing here See, that's, that's honestly, I wouldn't answer that question because that's between us and the seller. And at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've agreed on a value that makes sense for both of us. And I think it's a value that, uh, you know, we feel comfortable in uh, growing the business. And obviously, it's a value that the seller feels comfortable in selling. So I think it's, it's, it's uh, honestly, I think it's unfair to try to look at who's leaving value on the table because I don't think any deal gets done if somebody feels like they're leaving value on the table. So it's a fair value. Uh, you know, it's, it's a fair value for, uh, you know, if you look at how you guys value us, for example, you've set the growth and you've set margin and you've set predictability and you've given us a value. And, you know, we've used the same logic and we've come up with a value and the seller felt that it was a fair value. So saying that we're leaving or somebody is leaving value on the table is not right. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. We take the last question from the line of Sandeep S. from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just was eager to understand the sequence of transactions. So I think in Feb 2021, the parent of Cytec has taken a 100% control of the company. And now in this uh, uh, April of 2022, uh, we are selling the stake. So uh, uh, just wanted to understand how the valuations have happened in Feb and now as a whole. And why in a, such a short period of time we are exiting the 100% value code? No, no, I don't see Centica has owned Cytex since 2011. So uh, that's the, they've had it for, uh, it's, it's been a 10 year investment for the private equity. So I'm not sure what happened in uh, February. I think they had some business considering. First of all, I think I would uh, not go into those details. I want to say that it is a very clean transaction. They did have some changes in their parent level structure between financing on equity and bond. But I think in this call for us to discuss about them, it will be unfair. Uh, and I just want to assure everybody that everything is very, very clean. You should not be worried on any particular count. We are not worried on that count. It's just the way they have done their structuring of their balance sheet it has been changing between those two years. It will not be absolutely fair for us to, uh, you know, comment on uh, that particular aspect. But we are very comfortable in our due diligence to make sure the way we are acquiring the asset is absolutely clean. We are directly acquiring uh, Cytec, uh, and Cytec is absolutely clean and we get clean. Okay, okay. And just a second question, uh, more on macro. So if I look at the geopolitical issue, which can you know, lead the supply chain issues, especially on gas within Europe as a whole. So in that scenario, is it fair to say there could be more macro issue for this company, Cytec, at least in the next 6 to 12 months? Or do you believe, you know, that could be an opportunity for the uh, vendor like Cytec uh, to convert from gas to other uh, source of uh, power generation as a well? whole? So I think uh, that's one of the things that was quite attractive, and, and uh, it's a fair point that the current geopolitics would uh, uh, are a big risk, and therefore would spend a lot of time. I think there are a couple of things I'll say. One is I think it's a, it's an opportunity for Cytec because as both the uh, 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 sources of gas are changing and also the whole energy um, um, for the future is changing in Europe, the uh, opportunity for Cytec is quite uh, quite you know it's unique in a niche. Uh, also, in the shorter term, a couple of things are going to happen. Right? One is that uh, you know, the Russian gas will have to be replaced by other sources of gas. These include, this will include the need for uh, what's called, called um, um, LNG terminals to be built. For example, LNG terminals are, are nothing but large process plants that are built um, on the shore to bring gas. Or you know, new pipelines will have to be built, such as the ones that they're talking in uh, Southern Europe. So all of these things are actually good opportunities for CTEC um, um, in the short term. Uh, business, they, they, did, uh, they had very, very little dependency on uh, Russia or Belarus. Uh, there was a little bit of business, but that business obviously has been stopped. Uh, also, um, in the diligence process, we got a comfort of what the future business could have been and, and 
all that has also been taken off the table. Therefore, if anything, you know, the, the current business we're quite confident is uh, going to be uh, well positioned on the, um, uh, uh, or the current business is well positioned. And also in the future looks uh, like with the changes in uh, the uh, sources and also how gas is going to be brought in, etc. It's, it's, it's a good situation. The last thing, of course, is there's going to be more hydrogen, biomass, etc. Given that the EU is also declared those things as green sources. So all of those support uh, quite well. So, of course, I mean, there is, you know, the, 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 the risk that, that exists today is really a force majeure kind of risk for all of us. I mean, it is a real risk if, if, um, 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 if, if uh, Russia does something more aggressive in, uh, in Europe, especially in uh, Eastern Europe or Finland. It is a risk. But that's a force majeure risk. And therefore, you know, the board deliberated on it quite a bit, but I think we all agree that that's, that's, that's a risk that just exists for all of us. I mean, um, let's say that right, if Russia attacks NATO, then it is a much, much, seen, much more um, um, uh, significant issue than how the world's engineering services businesses are going to perform. So we just have to, um, um, I mean, we have to be aware of it, but uh, you know, that wasn't something that bothered the board uh, very much. Okay, fair enough. Congratulations and all the best. So thank you very much. I think that brings us to the uh, conclusion of the call. So I'll just uh, before handing it over to the moderator, I'll say all of you have been very supportive, and uh, I think all of you obviously understand our business quite well. So needless to say, the questions were also very uh, uh, insightful as we reflect back. So thank you for that. I just want to assure everybody that this is a very well thought through acquisition uh, from a strategic perspective, uh, uh, fixed perspective, but also equally importantly on the diligence that we went through on a financial, legal, etc. And uh, we're really excited uh, to welcome Johan and his team uh, to sign. And uh, I can assure you that there's some very, very good growth and exciting times ahead for us. So thank you, and uh, back to you, moderator. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Science Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.